what's kind of apples and oranges? There are a couple of uh, the, the film, <coughs> films that I really like, and uh, several of the episodes. And really, you have to be the, the content and how they develop the character and what Chekhov had to do. When he had something worthwhile to do, I then I had a good time. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek two and four were my favorite films. And shows like Spectre the Gun and uh, Trouble with Tribbles and two or three others were among my favorite episodes. How was Babylon 5? How was Babylon 5? <coughs> How was it? What do you mean, how was it? Did you enjoy that character? I enjoyed the character. I enjoyed the series. I enjoyed the folks. I had a very good time. I, I got along well with everybody. It was, you know, it was 20 years later, and they had uh, 20 years after Star Trek, and they have a, the industry had changed somewhat. In, su in some subtle ways, it had changed. And one of the ways it had changed is the... Uh, the hierarchy, the caste system that was so prevalent during the 60s uh, I don't know, among the people on the show was not as, um, not as obvious and not as evident um, by the time we got around to doing Babylon 5. So everybody pretty much treated each other as equals and, um, and the executives were as aware of the uh, eighth or ninth cast member as they were in the first as number one. So it was a, it was a the atmosphere was really a, a lot more pleasant. It was not the stress, the tension that comes when you have one or two cast members, cast members who are in who are the leads and everything is sort of all cues are taken from them. Is there a chance to do another character like that? I'm sorry? Is there a chance you'll do another character like that? Like Bester? What about my being like Bester? Oh. What's the no, idea? Is there a chance you'll do another character yeah. like that? Is there a chance? Oh, I don't know. I mean, would I like to do it? Yeah. I mean, you know, Bester was pivotal in the story. He had something to do in every episode that he appeared. Um, it wasn't like sitting there looking at buttons that don't function. <laughs> and trying to find out how many different ways you can say warp factor four. You know? <laughs> warp factor four, warp factor four, warp factor four. <laughs> but at the same time, I rush to add that I am enormously grateful for Star Trek. I hadn't been for Star Trek, I'm sure I wouldn't be an actor today. Uh, everything, no matter how, how remotely connected to Star Trek, is indeed still connected to Star Trek that I've done since then, whether it's writing a book or writing a, uh, or directing a play or whatever it is, it all has its, it all goes back to my being involved with Star Trek. So I'm, I feel very honored and very pleased that I was um, one of the people who was there pretty much at the beginning and that uh, the association, I've gone through evolutions uh, about the association of Star Trek. There was a time when I felt very proud and there was a time when I felt embarrassed because I was still receiving you know, adulation and applause and support for something that I was not participating in, you know, showing off the air. And that felt uncomfortable. That felt uncomfortable. It felt like we were lauding something that was kind of a ghost. And then we went back to making movies and I felt that I could hold my, hold my head up again. And at this point, you know, <laughs> I'm old enough to just, to just go with the flow. Uh, I, I, I try not to invest too much personal uh, feeling or interpretation to what the fan support means um, or that I should feel comfortable or uncomfortable by it. I just, I just enjoy it. Uh, on Star Trek, 
the crew often was put in situations that were not space related. Which of those, the, the cowboys or the city slippers, which of those did you enjoy sort of getting out of the regular space set to do? Well, there, I don't know if it's a, gen it's a generalization, I don't know if it's true. <coughs> it seems to me that when, when we were doing space related shows, I was sitting at, um, at the council and pushing the buttons. <laughs> Uh, when we got to go down to the planet um, and do other things, I had, I had more opportunity. Spectre of the Gun, for example, is one of my favorite shows. I, I think it's a show where mother was the necessity of invention. We had a low budget, and we had to make do, and as a consequence, we came up with a very creative show. A kind of abstract uh, set, and uh, the circumstances were unusual. And uh, I have a great deal of fun doing that particular episode. Thank you. Um, what was your favorite line the, um, ever seen in movies or in the TV show? How much? <laughs> 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 no, um, well, I guess it's nuclear to Wessels. I mean, it's really <laughs> very, very, very into Star Trek and you knew that Chekhov was going to be an ethnic character and had an accent. Did you just turn it on automatically or was it something you had to work through? Did you develop it or was it just, okay, Russian, go? No, my father was Russian and he spoke with a Russian accent. But I still, I went out and I bought a book and I studied the book. And uh, what the book doesn't tell you is the melody. The way the, the accent, what the, the language goes up and down and around. So I never really mastered the melody. I knew how to mispronounce the words, but uh, I, uh, I wasn't as, as good at, at giving the, the sense of the language, the flow. As a thespian in uh, your Star Trek series, your original ones, uh, which, uh, do you, which episode do you most fondly recall? And, uh, and if you'd like to relive that episode ever, ever again in, in, any, in, any other, uh, in any other setting or scene. No. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, there are episodes, like I said, Spectre of the Gun was one that I, I was very keen on. There were others that I thought were totally wrong. I thought the way to eat was, a, was, a, was three blind mice in a room pecking on a typewriter and had nothing to do with my character. Uh, all of a sudden he was an uptight establishment kind of a guy and that's not the way Chekhov was. Um, no, you know, having done it, let's go on and do something else. I, I firmly believe in not dwelling in the past but looking forward to the future. Russian character during the uh, Cold War era. And I was wondering, uh, because the character was Russian, was the response to your character mostly positive or negative, considering the era that it was done in? Well, the only mail that I received <coughs> that was sent to me, <coughs> it's all from kids who thought I was groovy, regardless of where I was from. Um, I never received any controversial mail. I never received any mail that said, what are you doing with a Russian on your show, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so in that regard, it was always very pleasant. Um, I'm, I only regret the fact my father didn't live long enough to see me on the show. It would have been a big kick for him. He seems very chauvinistic about his Russian heritage. So he would have liked it a lot. But no, I can answer your question. I, I, I was there for the for, for the monkey crowd, and uh, was it the haircut? <laughs> the haircut and the general look and the fact that I bore at that time somewhat of a resemblance to Davy Jones. <laughs> this story that I I tell I've told for 40 years, and even I'm getting tired of it. But you may not have heard it. Um, 
I was at a, I was at a dinner in a restaurant with some friends of mine <clears throat> who are all actors. And actors being actors, they really don't want to hear about any success you've had. <laughs> and a young lady came up to the table and she was all bouncy and full of life and nervous. And she asked me if I, if I was who she thought I was. And I said, well, I, I guess so. And I looked at my friends and they were all kind of chomping down on their <coughs> carrots with particular um, lack of a plum. And, um, rah, 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 rah. and uh, she said, well, could you, could you go over to my table? My girlfriend doesn't believe you, you are who I said you were. And, and I want to I settle, settle a bet. So I said, okay, and I started to get up, and she said, oh, and could you please sing Hey, Hey, We're the Monkeys? Thank you very much. <laughs> what is your opinion on uh, Anton Yelchin's version of your character and general opinion from the new original series? Anton Yelchin, who, who I met <coughs> on the set, I was invited on the set when they were shooting, bright young man very courteous, very nice. I have absolutely nothing negative to say about him. And I thoroughly enjoyed his performance. I thought he did a very good job. I think, uh, I think he could have made it even more his own. I don't think there's any, there's any, uh, there should be any uh, commandment that says you have to Im imitate the, uh, the former actor who played the role. I think the whole purpose is, is to make, it come, make the character come alive as that actor would play it, not as not an imitation of somebody else's work. So I thought it was delightful. He's um, very friendly. After the show was over, I went to the premiere, and after it was over, there was huge crowds around all of the actors in the show, and he saw, he saw me in the distance and he waved and said, Walter, they made a doll of my character. <laughs> An action figure. He was very pleased. That's how down to earth he was. I watched the show as a little kid with my mom, and now my daughter, who's seven, is just now starting to watch the show. What is it like to know that after all these years, the new generation of kids are still loving this show? Well, I'm, I'm tickled that People keep telling me every time I go to a convention that their parents or their, their children um, talk them into watching the show and they bonded with their families watching the show. That's what Star Trek was really all about. That was the unspoken, you know, subliminal statement of Star Trek. Um, which we always, we're always talking about people getting along together and learning to live like a big family. Well, all these folks who got together and sat down and shared an hour watching Star Trek, and they remember it. They remember enough to, to mention it and to come to conventions. Makes me feel like maybe in some small way, I, uh, I did contribute to the show. And uh, it makes me feel very good. characters who appeared on the show, which one has the most punchable face? Punchable face? Yes. Punchable. Who, did, who didn't I get along with? Um, I got along with George, I got along with Jimmy, and Forrest, and, and Michelle, and um, Leonard. And, uh, am I missing anybody? <laughs> Well, I haven't seen it. I, I've seen a, a very uh, early trailer uh, on the internet, and it was dark, and it was hard for me to see. I understand that the folks who have seen it 
They, they had a screening in Germany, which was extremely well received in Germany. Well, they're big Star Trek fans there anyway, the young people. Um, but I'm looking forward to it, and I think there's going to be a screening in a movie theater in uh, Los Angeles in August, beginning of August. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. It was, you know, I wasn't feeling too well when I was making that. I was feeling very weak. I was, in fact, I had a condition called hydrocephaly, hydrocephalus. 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 Yeah. And uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm reluctant to say cephalus because it sounds like syphilis. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with that. It was uh, commonly known as water on the brain. Liquid that flows from your spine through your body, and through your head, was not m moving. It wasn't in a, in a clean flow. It was, it was depositing on my head and staying there and caused me some balance problems and some um, cognitive problems. I was having problems remembering things. And we were doing, we were, that was happening while I was shooting that episode. So I, uh, I wasn't really on top of my game. Um, everybody was, you know, very kind and very pleasant, and everybody I think did a good job. So I'm, I'm hoping that whatever, um, whatever, whatever my failures were, they're not too obvious. Thank you. Um, even though that your character never died on the show, but he was always wearing a red shirt. <laughs> my character never died on the show, but he was always what? Wearing a red shirt, because a lot of times... I was wearing a red shirt? No. Check off the middle of red shirt. <laughs> I wore, I wore the standard yellowish green thing that they had. Oh, you mean, even when we made the movies, we wore them. That was maroon. Yeah. Maroon and red are not the same. I always dyed my hair red. Yeah. I, only die, I, I did dye once on, on Star Trek. I, and I, I went to the story editor and explained that. I asked him how he's going to explain that. And that was in Gunfight of the O.K. Corral. Uh, the uh, specter of the gun. The, uh, the crew learns that they won't, the, 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 they're impervious to the bullets of the Clanton gang if they don't believe they're real. Um, because it was all an illusion. So they could go into battle and not be hurt. They didn't learn this until after I had been shot. <laughs> so by, by all Workings, it should have been that Chekhov did die because he did not know the bullets were not real. And I went and I spoke to the story editor and I said, How are we going to explain this? He says, We're not. He says, We thought about it. And he said, Ah, screw it. Do I what? Were you close to Leonard? No. I was not close. I was closer to Mr. Spock than I was to Leonard Nimoy. That's because Leonard was always Mr. Spock on the set. He was you know, very, very uh, dedicated to being the character and making it real. And it was. It was the most real, or I, I'm concerned, the most real character on the show. Um, I totally believe that any, I totally believe that a hundred different actors could play each of our roles quite effectively. He did as good a job as we did. We being everybody but Leonard. Leonard was Spock. He had so developed that character and so became so much a part of it that you, you cannot distinguish him from that character. And, uh, and that's including the, the chap that played him in the two features. I thought he was, I thought he was pretending. He was pretending to be a Vulcan. Leonard was this character. And what made him so enthralling and so extraordinary was on a subconscious level, I think many people felt that when they were watching him, they were really watching an alien, a part alien, because he was so invested in that, in that character. And that's the way he was 
when the camera stopped rolling, he was still with the spot. So I, that's the way I, you know, I, I wasn't very close to him because of that. But I had great admiration. It's an interesting question, and uh, it deserves a, 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 a non-facetious answer. But I can't think of one. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I, I think we've grown further apart. Uh, co it's just coincidentally. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not gonna, I'm, I hope never to talk to George again. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill, you know, doesn't really talk to you anyway. You know, he talks past you. <clears throat> Michelle's a sweetheart. That's all I'll say. Can we expect to see you in anything else? Or are you maybe in the, the third Star Trek? Or no, I'm not in the third Star, Star Trek. That would have been fun. I would have enjoyed that. No, uh, but I am uh, working in partnership with some people who are doing a an episode based on the life of Captain Pike. And I came aboard with the understanding that I would help write it and help produce it, as well as forming it. Not as, not as Chekhov, this time actually as a bad guy. Um, and, uh, More like Bester? What? More like Bester? No, not that, no. This is a, this is a guy who has a, a lot of, he's carrying on a, a lot of baggage. Which, I, which, of course, I have to be able to justify as, the, as, the, as an actor. And I, and I, and I, I know how I'm going to do that. Um, but I, well, what I'm hoping is that this will be, this will not simply be how close can we come to the original Star Trek. I mean, it's been done, and it's been done quite well with these you know, low budget productions. What I want is how we bring Star Trek into the 21st century, not with CGI and the pyrotechnics, but with storytelling and character telling. So I want all the characters to be dimensioned. All of them have a back, history, back, back life, a back history. And that there be story twists that you don't expect. My inspiration is um, Game of Thrones and, um, and Mad Men. I want to see how, how realistically we can do it without, for those of you who are about to say, the canon, without destroying the canon, without um, uh, uh, corrupting it, uh, but make this make the individuals and the stories a little more than the lifestyle. Thank you very much. Thanks for the Bester lead-in. Um, as much as I enjoyed you in Star Trek, I really, really loved your Bester. And um, I wanted to ask, how much of him was JMS's creation? How much of him was your creation in terms, not just of the dialogue, but of the mannerisms, the way you carried your menace, all that? How much of that came from you versus JMS? James, uh, uh, Joe Strusinski was responsible for the dialogue. Totally responsible for the dialogue. I changed about four lines. I changed the line about a pinata. It's one of the lines that I changed. Other than that, everything else came from me. Everything was, was me. Uh, and that was, that was great. It was, it was a, a mark of his, of his uh, helmsmanship that he, that he let the actors had their wings and let them explore and find out these characters and make them themselves. People ask me, how does it feel to play a bad guy? I never felt like I played a bad guy. I felt like I played a guy who was very much involved uh, with the loyalty, loyalty to his people and, and his captainship to his people, his leadership, and that um, uh, 
I was doing the right thing. Um, as, if, you, if you editorialize, you, you can't do a character justice because then you're, you're doing an imitation. You've got you to embrace it, make it your own. And that's what I tried to do. Did you know the art along the way when you were first brought in, or were you as surprised by what happened over the episodes with your character, or were you, were you, were you aware of the art, or was it unfolded to you along the it way? It was unfolded. I mean, I had to find, I mean, I had made one decision about him, and then the next week I found something that sort of put that in contradiction, and I said, well, how do I make that work? You know, how do I make that consistent? So it was a, it was a process of giving, taking all the elements that I was given and making them into one person. I definitely thought you really enjoyed that role. I loved it. I had a ball. I had an absolute ball. I, I, it was the best time I've had in television. When I was in school, we had slide rules and uh, manual typewriters and things like that. So I was uh, wondering if there was any futuristic technology on Star Trek that you looked at and saw and, and thought, oh, this is, this is never going to happen, but then later did become reality. And what was your, your reaction to things like thumb drives and things like that that we see that are similar to Star Trek? The only thing that I didn't think would happen and hasn't to my knowledge is beaming up. <laughs> Everything else seems to be happening. I am not a, I'm not a, uh, a technology guy. I'm, you know, I, I just ex accept it. And the fact that we, we now have, in play, many of the uh, um, processes that we had on the show, I think is fun. It's, it's not something that makes me. It doesn't, it doesn't doesn't excite my libido and it doesn't excite my ego. I, I'm, I'm happy for it, but it's not um, the, 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 the funny moment I had. If I can please remember these two guys' names on um, Deep Space when we did the the Triggles show on Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. you remember that when they went back, we didn't. They went back to our show. Colin, Meany. Oh, yeah, and the doctor. What's the name? Julian Bashir was the character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I heard they were going to shoot a scene um, that was from our show, from our old show. They were going to recreate the uh, bar room. So they, they go back in time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to go see it. I wanted to see them doing it. So I slipped onto the set surreptitiously and kind of hid in the background behind everybody else. And I saw these two guys, these two actors who were now going on. I, well, Colin always worked. He's always worked. The other chapters have been doing a lot of feature films and doing a lot of good work. And I saw them communicating, trying, they were rehearsing, keeping it open. And they snap it open and it would flap back down again. And I was watching this as they were getting ready to shoot it. And I got more and more frustrated. <laughs> and before long, I heard somebody yell, cut! And I realized it was me. <laughs> and I stepped out of the, the crowd. They didn't, no, no one knew I was there. And I walked up to them and I said, give me that, please. <laughs> <laughs> they looked at each other and they looked at me and they handed it over. And I said, pay attention. And I was praying that it was going to work. <laughs> yeah, really. And I knew it, so I went, and stay open. I said, there. <laughs> and I walked out, uh, and I walked out the stage. <laughs> it was a very proud moment. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask a question regarding your work on Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. In your scenes with Ricardo Montalban, do you have memories that you, of your work with Ricardo Montalban? Yes. In that, in that movie? What, what, what can you share with us? Carlos, Carlo, Carlo Montalban. Ricardo Montalban. Ricardo, yeah. I, I, I have great memories of, what's his name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ricardo Montalban, yes. He's a, a fine gentleman, very courteous, very continental, 
I mean, whenever he was introduced to a lady, he would kiss her hand. He was absolutely delightful. He was absolutely delightful. I had, I had great fun with him. Uh, it, was a joy, it, was a, it was a joy to work with. Particularly since he was a movie star and had done, you know, many things. And he was, he, he was just one of the guys. I mean, you could, you, you could always pick him out of the crowd. He seemed so much bigger than life. Um, ah, how are you? <laughs> Uh, but he was just a delightful man, very charming man. Um, I remember once, right at the beginning, Nick, we, were, we rehearsed the scene and Nick Meyer called us into the, into the um, uh, dressing room to talk to all of us. And, and Nick was you know, very fresh to all of this. And he certainly didn't know our cast. And he said to Ricardo, um, uh, you know, but you're doing this a little big, it's a little broad. And I thought, oh God, here it comes, here it comes. You can't say that to a movie star. You can't say that in front of other people. And Ricardo went, I see what you mean. Where's Bill Shatner when you need him? <laughs> so I was, I was delighted with, with Ricardo. He was a charming man to work with. Thank you. Hi. By the way, they put some water on the table for you behind you. What's that? Water? There's some water there now. What is this? Yeah. What are you? Is water from, water from your you. staff. Oh, this is water for you. This is water for you. Is that it? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> Let's give it up to our guest today, Mr. Walker James. It was an absolute pleasure, sir. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Walker. 